All right, uh, thanks for coming out early in the morning here, and uh, thanks for this opportunity to come and tell you a little bit about our work. I really had a great time the last time I gave a talk at the JGI. I think I talked about pythons and boas and whatnot, and uh, uh, hopefully that went over well enough that you invited me back, so that's great. Uh, a couple things have changed in the last few years. I'm now um, co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. I just wanted to give a shout out to that to let people know where I'm at now. Uh, 50% uh, of my time is still spent at UCSF, where I still maintain my lab, and 50% of that time is now spent across the street at a new nonprofit 501c3 medical research organization called the Biohub. It is uh, separate and distinct from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is a grant-giving organization funded by Mark and Priscilla. We're a research institute. And at this research institute, we uh, have uh, an investigator program where we're funding about 50 different investigators at the three universities, UCSF, Stanford, and Berkeley. The Biohub is meant to bring together these re research institutions. And uh, with reference to this particular meeting in this session, we have a very strong emphasis on infectious disease. It's not the only thing we do. We do technology development and some, uh, a lot of basic science, but the infectious disease initiative is uh, run by the folks that you see here, these group leaders, and it falls into the categories of detection, response, treatment, and prevention. Obviously in detection, something we'll be talking about more about today, is a lot of NGS-based pathogen detection and identification in a broad range of different species and systems, and I'll have some words to say about what the Biohub is doing there towards the end, uh, as well as technology development for microbial antibiotic resistance genes. Uh, and their use in clinical settings in terms of outbreaks, hospital-acquired infection control, and other aspects. Uh, in response, we are partnering with a bunch of uh, worldwide groups, including you know, folks like the CDC, WHO, GORN, and others, to um, support them uh, with respect to outbreaks. And one of the ways we're doing this is we'll be launching a new informatic portal called the Global IDC Portal. It's not public yet, but it's coming soon, so keep an eye out for that. And that's going to provide a cloud-based informatic research and analysis platform for our worldwide partners that do surveillance in a variety of different countries, and available to anyone, frankly, who's academic. Uh, we also are going after small molecule therapeutics for viruses in particular, and we have a strong emphasis on negative strand RNA viruses. Uh, especially uh, Ebola and other um, viruses in that category. In prevention, we're really focusing on broadly neutralizing antibodies, not as therapeutics, but as a means to identify and characterize the immunogens which can elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies, both in positive and negative strand RNA viruses in particular. All right, so that's about all I'm going to really say about the Biohub. If you have questions about it, I'm happy to, to tell you more about the Biohub at the break, and there's a lot of information on our website. All right, so one of the main things that we do in my lab and a big activity at the Biohub under DETECT is metagenomic next-gen sequencing for infectious disease. And, and um, ra uh, there's a strong emphasis in the lab on trying to translate that clinically and to make it relevant in a clinical setting in a way that can affect decision-making, outcomes, and cost. And so we've been trying to demonstrate this in a variety of different settings, both in neurological, sepsis, respiratory, and ophthalmological. There are other settings, too, which this is being applied, but I'm just going to tell you about a couple of these and then tell you about some of the non-human stuff that we do, because that's always popular at this meeting. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to tell you about is a case that is, uh, it's already published, but it's an interesting case, and I think it's relevant to this meeting, because it has a lot to do with virus evolution and it's our investigations into ophthalmology. And so let me just start with the case and tell you about the virus. Um, now again, it, no stranger to this group, the way that we go about this is just turning everything into metagenomics. And so I'm going to cut out all the introduction slides about what metagenomics is and how sequencers work and all that and get right to the punch. But basically, we want to turn everything into sequence. And our general pipeline for this uh, that we've kind of honed over the years is one that's fairly simple, but the devil's in the details. And of course, in the clinical setting, we want speed. And the pipeline looks something like this. So basically, raw reads go in. Now, I, you know, these are FASTQ files from Illumina sequencers. They could be min-ion sequencers. They could be other kinds of sequencers, too. It's not really uh, particular to one format or another. We get rid of human reads first as fast as we can. We compress redundant reads. We filter for complexity using LZW. 
Uh, and then we clean it up with another round of uh, human removal, looking at things like chimp and other things similar to human. And then it begins you know, a long haul through NT and NR alignments, followed by aggregation of hits into taxonomic reporting structures, which can be followed by de novo assembly or other analysis, depending on what's there. And so this is actually a case, this is not a case that I'm going to talk about today. This was a, a, a patient that actually was infected with a tapeworm. That's a great story. Not going to talk about it today, though, especially at breakfast. Um, and, uh, but you can see the pipeline here from start to finish for an, an average patient sample. It's about anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes full for the full bioinformatic analysis. So it's as fast as we could possibly make it. Uh, it can get faster than this because this particular version isn't cloud distributed. If we chunk it and, and scale it in a cloud distributed way, this could be, you know, when, once it's under 10 minutes, it's sort of pointless. It's fine. You know, don't need to get any faster than that. All right, so the case I'm going to tell you about today in ophthalmology is a 40-year-old guy with a 21-year history of uveitis. Uveitis is super interesting to us because it's inflammation of the eye, and over 50% of uveitis cases are unresolved. No one knows what causes them. Could be a virus, could be a bacteria, could be something, but most of them go without diagnosis, which is the sad truth. They usually just get empiric antibiotics or topical steroids and hope for the best. And this guy was exactly in that category. And he's had uveitis for 21 years. So he grew up in Stuttgart, Germany, and he has a distinct memory in 1993 of a three-day full-body rash and fever. That'll become relevant and important shortly. Uh, in 1999, six years later, he develops uveitis in his left eye. It's inflammation of the eye. It's sensitive to light. Um, it's not a fun thing to have. He was put on topical steroids. It didn't really have that much of an effect, but uh, they kept him on it for some period of time. A couple years later, unfortunately, his right eye then developed uveitis. And this is a sign that there may be an infectious process happening here. Uh, he came to the United States, ironically, to study microbiology, uh, which is kind of cool. He got glycoma drops for the increased inflammation and pressure in his eye. Uh, and then he was put on prednisone and methotrexate under the suspicion that this was an autoimmune disease. Unfortunately, it, it made it worse. And so whenever there's a, um, an immunosuppression step that makes the, the situation worse, again, indicative of, of likelihood of an infectious process. So they took him off the prednisone and methotrexate. He came to UCSF's Proctor Center for Ophthalmology uh, in 2012. He was seen by Tui Don, who is the lead ophthalmologist on this uh, study and worked in my lab. He was tested for a variety of the greatest hits of herpes viruses and toxoplasma and some other things, and those are all negative. Uh, but he was put on oral antivirals on suspicion that this might be a herpes virus anyway. He did not improve. Uh, and let me just show you his eyes for a second. It's kind of interesting. There's the right and left eye. You can see that there's some um, inflammation there. But I think what is more, more telling and interesting is the fact that this individual's eyes were originally all dark brown. And now they've changed to blue. And they've changed asymmetrically. So this was the one that's more farther along than the other. And so this is asymmetric heterochromia. It is evidence that the, the, you know, the iris is degrading through some sort of progressive inflammatory process. And so now, anybody that comes to an ophthalmology clinic that has inflammatory process with asymmetric heterochromia, like, I want those people. Just refer them to me. I'll set them up. We know they got infections. All right, so uh, what we do here is really simple. We will take intraocular fluid from the person's eyeball, and, uh, and then we'll deep sequence that. This, this individual actually had complete victorectomy for a palliative uh, relief, in which they take all the fluid out of the eye and then fill it up with gas. Okay, and, the, uh, the end, and at the end of the day, when we sequence all this and put it through the pipeline, his eye was uh, essentially infected with one infectious agent and one only, and it turned out to be rubella virus. And we have coverage of the entire genome of rubella virus in this. That's sort of interesting because rubella virus, as you know, single strand, um, single strand positive strand RNA virus, responsible for congenital rubella syndrome, a lot of birth defects, microcephaly, and so on. There's a great vaccine for it. It is not globally distributed, unfortunately. And in the 1990s, at least, in Germany, only girls were vaccinated. It's a cost measure, actually, and boys don't have babies, so 
you know, if it's a mild self-limiting rash, then, then why not? Uh, well, here's why not. Because there are certain immunologically privileged locations, like the eyes and the testes, where you can have long-term replicative cycle of viruses, including RNA viruses that are not, don't have latent phases or integrate in the genome or things like that. And rubella is certainly an example of that. Now, one could argue that maybe that this rubella, he got it in 1993, is certainly consistent with his, well, first the question is, did he get it in 1993? We don't know that. Maybe this is a random piece of rubella virus junk that's been floating around in his eye and has nothing to do with this 1993 episode, or it's never been replicating. It's just hanging out. We can answer that a little bit, though, because phylogenetically, it turns out that his virus lines up best with 1992 Stuttgart, Germany, rubella. And so it's the closest thing to his city that he lived in and one year apart from when he had his full body rash and fever. And so I would, uh, I would assert, based just on the phylogenetics, that this virus was in his eye for the full 21-year period and that he got it in 1993. Um, now, that's interesting. Is it replicating or not, though? Because maybe you just got it and just floating around. Maybe the eye is just a dead-end waste can for viruses that can just float around. Well, that's easy to look at, too. If we map where the synonymous and non-synonymous mutations are relative to 1992 Stuttgart, Germany, as a reference, uh, in black are the non-synonymous and red, sorry, in black are the synonymous and the red are non-synonymous, you can see a pattern of mutation that should be awfully telling. There's about six-fold more mutations per unit length in the structural genes than the non-structural genes. And there's quite a few mutations across the genome. Um, and so if you actually line it up with the known um, uh, mutation rate for rubella and substitutions per site per year, it's entirely consistent with 21 years of continuous replication. Furthermore, it's consistent with that replication period under immunological pressure. Yes, the eye is a privileged site, but it's not protected completely. My guess is, is that it replicates in the eye. And by the way, every other year he reports getting a rash on his legs. So my guess is there's systemic release of the virus from his eyes as new genotypes overcome whatever immunity he has, and then it retreats back, a couple years of evolution, new releases, and so on. So this guy's eyes are doing the experiment you would never do or propose in an NIH grant, which is, I'm going to evolve um, you know, a pathogenic virus for 21 years under immunological pressure. And by the way, he did get the MMR vaccine when he came to the United States, and he's immunocompetent. So the real question for this particular patient and the evolution of this virus, and by the way, He's not the only one. We have several um, uveitis patients now that are positive for rubella in their eyes. They all come from Europe from around the same time period. Uh, the, but the real question for his eyes is, you know, is he a public health risk or not? I mean, his personal question is, what can you do about it? Answer is nothing. No one's ever done a drug screen, as far as I know, for rubella because there's a vaccine for it. So there are no small molecule therapeutics other than things like, you know, interferon drops and things like that. Uh, so in terms of what is going to happen to his eyes and his, his uh, livelihood is not totally clear. Um, but is he a public health risk? That's the other question. And so actually to assay this, what we've been doing is uh, cloning the structural part of his genes and make a producer cell line such that we can make an, an infectious clone that's just one step infection and then assay whether his virus is neutralized by the serum of the general population that's presumably vaccinated or not. Because if he's done this experiment in his eyes long enough that the virus escapes uh, neutralization, that would be a concern. Now, we've done this. We've actually cloned his structural genes. We put it in there. And um, with uh, much to my uh, disappointment, the, the virus does not, it does not produce virus when you mate his structural genes to the non-structural genes of the wild type. Therefore, we're going to have to clone the whole thing and put it in, which I really didn't want to do and also has some safety concerns and all that. Uh, but I think that is the direction that unfortunately we'll have to go. So the question of whether he's a public health concern and whether latent reservoirs and eyeballs can uh, you know, result in new emergent strains that bypass neutralization by currently used vaccines is an unanswered question, and I wish I could give it to you today. But by golly, we're going to get it one way or the other. And, and maybe yes, it may be no. Maybe it's a not a fit virus. We'll see. All right, so that was the, week, the work of Tweedon.
Um, I want to talk about a neurological case here uh, to illustrate how the same technology and approach can be used in a neurological infection before we get into talking about things that are non-human. Uh, so this is, this is another really interesting case, and it's, again, a case of where people didn't see it coming. This is a 34-year-old guy who had three years of subacute dementia. So he had uh, a really interesting, uh, interesting history. This is his neurological exam. He's being asked to um, touch his finger to his nose. And I think it's pr pretty easy to see here that he's got severe ataxia and tremors. And, um, uh, the, uh, and, and if, if one were to listen to the audio, he's not mentating correctly either. They're giving him instructions to change hands, and he's sort of following it, sort of not. Um, and so. Uh, this is obviously a very severe case of neurological decline in ataxia, and the question is, what the heck is going on with this guy? So he's an interesting case because he was born with an immunodeficiency. He's born with an immunodeficiency that prevents him from making mature B cells. But he's been on intravenous inter, uh, immunoglobins for the majority of his life and otherwise led a very normal life, had a retail job as a uh, store manager and so on. He had done four trips to North Carolina, including a lot of camping trips and tubing down rivers and so on. Uh, and he complained of mosquito bites during that time. That'll become relevant. Uh, and he had a severe febrile incident following one of these trips that landed him in the ICU with encephalitis. And following that time was a, a slow decline of global mental capacity, memory, cognition, and if you'll see, you'll see on the MRI, uh, of his brain's actually gone under atrophy as well. So this progressive dementing illness looked like rapid, sort of a rapid neurological um, disease, but of unknown source. All right, so this is his MRI, and so it's kind of no joke. There are huge, giant ventricles, and there's a, a depletion of both white matter and gray matter, but I think what's really interesting here is the sort of the pathology report that no fe the features are you know, nonspecific progressive neurodegeneration, but no features suggest intracranial infection. And they did multiple brain biopsies on him. They were subjected to electron microscopy. Uh, uh, you know, all send out assays that you can imagine, and uh, all the greatest hits of neurological infection, JC virus, you know, many others, West Nile, all came back negative. Um, and so they were left with trying to figure out whether this was linked to his autoimmunity, I mean, his lack of an immune system, whether it's some weird autoimmune process, or is this some unrealized infection. So again, what we take is CSF or brain matter material, and we do metagenomic sequencing through our pipeline. We have a lot of technologies, I should mention, by the way, that deplete the host and enrich for the virus. Uh, one of them is called FLASH, and another one's called DASH. You can look them up. The DASH technology is published. It uses Cas9 in a programmable way to deplete the most abundant unwanted sequences from our libraries. And it's independent of the library prep or what you do or even whatever technology you use. So I encourage you to check that out. We use that on this guy because the, the number of reads to the virus in this particular case were really small, and I don't think we would have gotten it unless we'd done some fancier library prep technologies. All right, so again, he's negative for the tests, the brain biopsy, um, was negative for fungal bacterial parasitic organisms. What was it? Cache Valley virus. And it was so few reads that we barely picked it up. We were able to confirm it and both PCR it out and do immunohistochemistry on brain biopsy material. What is Cache Valley virus, though? I'd never heard of it. So it turns out it's an arbovirus, so when tip off, again, for mosquito bites, and it's in the Bunia viridia family. And that, of course, that family has some of the greatest hits of nasty encephalitis viruses. So lacrosse virus, which is well known, is in that family, California encephalitis virus, and Cache Valley. Cache Valley, though, don't really hear about it, even though it was identified here in the United States in the 50s. But it's thought as a wildlife virus or a livestock virus. It's known to cause birth defects in sheep and goats and other livestock. Um, it is, there's evidence that it is seroprevalent in the population, especially among park rangers, of all things. However, none of those people are really developing disease. But remember, he's an immunocompromised individual and was likely not on his IVIG probably during his camping trips. And so he might be unusually susceptible. That is, immunocompromised individuals in the population are often the canaries in the coal mine. And, and here is one, unfortunately. 
All right, so it was first isolated in Cache Valley, Utah in 1956 from mosquitoes caught under a bridge. I mentioned it causes birth defects. It's um, not really been studied so much since then. There's only been three cases of neuroinvasive disease with Cache Valley. One of them was from North Carolina, and he had visited that general area. Uh, not saying that's where he got it, but um, it's probably distributed across the United States, and we just don't really appreciate it. Immunohistochemistry uh, demonstrated that indeed it was in his brain tissue, uh, and that's really unfortunate. There was no cure for it. There is no therapeutic. There was no way to stop it. And unfortunately, the patient in this case passed away. But at the, I would say the, the saving grace of this is that there was closure for both the family and they were able to stop doing very invasive and damaging uh, and in some cases very painful procedures like multiple brain biopsies. Uh, hopefully identifying pathogens like this will lead to better experimental therapies. Perhaps if this was caught earlier, Maybe something experimental could have tried, like a um, you know, non-nucleoside inhibitor or a nucleotide inhibitor. But it's hard to say. Uh, in this case, we got closure. We weren't able to save the patient. But it's an example of you know, clinical presentation, interesting phenotype, presenting something you never saw coming in an interesting background, biological background, in this case, an immunocompromised individual. All right. Uh, we used to, I used to say this last talk that it would be great if these things that we did were out of the research lab and that a doctor could just order this. And, and I always get these questions about when's that going to happen? And I said, I don't know, maybe never. But it's now happened. So at UCSF, uh, let the, let it, leaving the charge is Charles Chu and Steve Miller at UCSF, our CLIA lab, CLIA and CAP approved lab, does metagenomic next gen sequencing for neurological infection in exactly the manner I just described. And so any doctor anywhere in the United States can order this test for their patient. And that's like a great thing because we've been you know, trying really hard to push NNGS into the clinic and have it actually be used and have a rapid turnaround. So the turnaround time is 72 hours, costs about 1,000 bucks, 1,600, somewhere in there. And uh, for many of these encephalitis patients who are in the ICU where the room charges are up to $17,000 a day just for the room, small price to pay. And I believe that an unbiased, hypothesis-free metagenomic testing like this could improve outcomes by pointing clinicians to appropriate solutions uh, and care earlier, and ultimately by improving outcomes and getting people out of earlier, reduce cost. So we'll see. There'll be a large um, follow-up study on this uh, uh, CLIA version of the test at UCSF, and we'll know if it actually decreases cost and improves outcome. Uh, but I, I firmly believe that's where it's going to land. So this is great. It's no longer a research test. Doctor can order it. I'm still interested in research, though, and uh, we are rolling this out in a lot of different areas. And so instead of just doing this in San Francisco with patients that happen to be at UCSF, one of the areas that this is incredibly used for is in surveillance of fevers of unknown origin in developing countries. And so this is a study from the Turo District of Uganda. It's ongoing. It's not published yet, uh, in which fevers of unknown origin that were, that were supposed to be non-malaria, so smear negative, were collected, both serum, nasopharyngeal swab, and stool. So all three samples on each patient. Uh, in reality, we didn't get all three samples on every patient, but we got a lot of them. And these patients were coming in suffering from diarrhea, gastroenteritis, meningitis, you know, malaria, looked like malaria but smear negative, sepsis, and who knows what. And so in just these surveillance efforts, you can get an idea of what the molecular landscape of the pathogens are. Uh, and so in, I'm just going to jump right to the data. In NP swabs, it kind of looks like what you'd expect for respiratory viruses. It is the greatest hits of respiratory viruses, including lots of rhinoviruses, metanumaviruses, the parainfluenzas, RSV, coronas, and so on. But I want to make a point in particular about the rhinoviruses. Uh, these rhino Cs, rhino Cs are now realized as one of the more, um, the more aggressive forms of rhinovirus and probably one of the most diverse forms of rhinovirus. And so many of these rhinoviruses represent uh, new strains in the species having less than 80 percent amino acid identity or below. And so there's a ton of new rhino Cs that I think are unrealized uh, on the African continent. And they cause aggressive disease. Uh, Jim Gern, uh, Ann Palmenberg, and others have studied this, and they're linked to asthma and other kinds of bad outcomes. And so that, that was interesting and important to realize that Reynolds sees a big deal there, too. In the serum samples, um, 
one of the things that, you know, malaria is smear negative, yet there's a whole bunch of malaria. So probably not surprising, malaria smears are not all that sensitive. But what we didn't realize is the extent of parvovirus infection. So parvovirus is a DNA virus, B19 is the, is the culprit here, causes, can cause severe anemia or aplastic anemia. And so parvovirus, you know, on top of malaria or malaria presenting with anemia uh, can just make life a lot worse. Uh, we did see uh, the smattering of enteroviruses and herpes viruses and so on. We also saw a, an orthobunia virus that really stood out. And of course, we de novo assembled that sucker, and it's really off the map. It's a novel orthobunia virus. We're calling it Nyangola virus for the township that it was um, identified in near Tororo. It is uh, really out there. So the most conserved segment, the L segment, the polymerase, is less than 60% amino acid identity. Um, and it's clustered in with other orthobunia viruses known to cause human disease. And it was high levels in the serum. We didn't have to go in and recover more sequence. It was easy to assemble all segments pretty deep coverage from this one infected individual. And so we'd like to go back and find out what the distribution of this is, how several prevalent is, does it cause, what kind of disease does it cause. We don't have great follow-up on this pilot study. And so this pilot study is going to motivate us, of course, to do a much larger study in a couple different other areas in Africa with our partners. And so this was the work with Phil Rosenthal, um, Akshaya Ramesh, and others. Um, all right, so in the, in the remaining time, I see I've only got a few minutes left here, I really want to talk about non-human species because we have a lot of fun in non-human species. The last time I talked about pythons and boas here. The thing I want to talk about today is our, our recent work on birds, and this is the work of Maxine Zilberberg. And this is a really weird disease called avian keratin disorder. And so the same technology can be applied for ecological infectious diseases. This is a strange disorder in which, here's a normal black-capped chickadee, normal beak, and that's avian keratin disorder, and it's easy to see what it is. It's massive overgrowth of beaks, and it affects the cells that produce the keratin in these, bir these bead, uh, bird beaks, uh, and they get grossly overgrown, causing them to un be unable to feed, to preen, and to do other activities to keep themselves fit. And so a lot of birds uh, may succumb to this or die of this in the winter. Others can break the beak off and continue to persist, but um, it causes a big fitness drop in these birds. Uh, and, and here's kind of examples. They go from sort of no undergrowth into increasingly grotesque overgrowth. And there's a lot of dysplasia in the beak around the cells that produce the keratin. Reminiscent, actually, of papillomaviruses. So that's what we were thinking initially. Um, uh, initial studies have identified uh, large uh, amounts of bird species with AKD, especially up in Alaska in the north and other areas of the northeast of the United States. 6.5% prevalence in black-capped chickadees up there, first observed by the USGS in 1991. It has now been found in a lot of other birds. It's unclear, though, whether that's the same thing or something different. Is it a toxin? Is it something else in the environment? So obviously, uh, one of our jobs is to figure out, is this an infectious agent or not? I wouldn't be telling you about it if I didn't think it was. Uh, and so we'll get right to it. What do we do? We cut off beaks and throw them in the sequencer. Um, we do grind them up. Uh, and the results were really clear. There's abundant amounts of a brand new percornavirus in these beaks of affected birds that were absent in controlled bird beaks. This percornavirus is pretty far out there. So here's a sliding window of amino acid identity across the polyprotein. And you're in the twilight zone of the low 20% amino acid identity in many regions of the virus. Uh, it has the typical genome structure and organization of percornaviruses that we all know and love. Uh, but it is really far out there on the tree. It is grouped with the megaviruses and percornavirus land. So all these orange ones over here are bird uh, percornaviruses. And this guy is right here, kind of far out on the tree. So it does cluster with other avian coronaviruses, but it's not one that's really ever been on the radar. Uh, that doesn't, show, doesn't prove it, has, it causes the disease, and we haven't proved it causes the disease at all either, but we can show an association. And so here's a histogram of birds. Orange are, are positive for Poichi virus, which we're calling it. Blue are negative for Poichi virus. And the histogram is beak length. So here's 43 millimeters. That's something grotesque like this. And here's normal beak length in here. And this is kind of like the line that the USGS says above here we're calling AKD. And it actually maps really well with infection versus non-infected. There are some cases that have normal beak lengths that are infected. Now, many of these might have 
broken off their beaks or honed them down, or maybe they haven't really gotten the hyperplasia yet or the extended beaks. Hard to tell, but what we can say is that at least two of these birds, because they have tags on them, were trapped and measured on two subsequent seasons in Alaska. And on the first season, they were here, and they were positive. And on the second season they were trapped, they now had long beaks. So it is, it is reasonable in my mind to um, make the conjecture that really that these guys that are infected are likely to become long-beaked birds and have avian keratin disorder. Now to really do this, you need to purify the virus and do a controlled infection with birds in a controlled environment to prove whether this is the real deal or not. Those experiments are underway. I, I, I don't have results for you on them, but that, that's going to happen because without that, this still remains association and really isn't you know, fully causation. Um, I will say that um, one of the interesting things about this virus is that we've now been identified, we've now been able to identify it in a large number of species. So a great number of corvids, so crows, and ravens have been captured with, a, with um, abnormal beak growth. So you can see this crossed, abnormally long beak in a, in a crow here. And in those birds, we have also recovered poichi virus. They're about, from these different species, whether it be woodpeckers or nuthatches that have these weird beaks, the virus is all in, you know, tends to be about 9 to 10% different from each other, from species to species. We do see the majority of differences in the structural genes. Uh, indicating there may be some selective pressure going on there. But the, what I'm sort of concluding with here is that I don't think this is just a black cap chickadee virus. We think that it has broad distribution in the population and may be associated with a very similar kind of phenotype, that is this um, hyper beak growth phenotype, in a la much larger set of species. And interestingly, there's actually been some raptors now reported with avian keratin disorder. Uh, and we're hoping to, to dig into some of those raptors to see if they also have the virus. To what degree can it be controlled or where can this go? It's not clear. Um, just to wrap that up, we have at least seven more species now that we've shown that are positive for Puichi virus. There's another beak disc growth here. We have at least one real uh, full length genome from a nuthatch that is, uh, you know, lots that has enough differences that we can say we believe that there's at least selective pressure going on in this virus. The association that we're gathering continues to strengthen, does not prove causality. We do not have a culture model yet. We did everything in our power to try and culture this dang virus, including inoculating sterile chicken eggs and like, you know, all the classic techniques. And so far, we've been completely unable to culture this virus or find a culture system that works. And we've tried dozens and dozens of avian cell lines and so on. So that's disappointing, but we're not going to give up uh, quite yet. And so again, this has been the work of Maxine Zilberberg. So I'm going to finish in the last couple minutes here with what the BioHub's actually doing in virology and in sort of viral diversity. We're really interested in mosquitoes, and mosquitoes are really relevant for our partner countries that we're working with, such as you know Brazil, the recent outbreak of Zika, and the ongoing um, reemergence of yellow fever. Uh, that all, of course, are mosquito-borne diseases. And while there's been uh, um, several forays into the areas of mosquitoes and viruses, um, there really hasn't been anything too systematic. Uh, and we have issues right here in California. As you probably know, we have over 40 mosquito control districts right here in California. They spend a lot of money. And a lot of the decisions have to do with whether they're going to spray pyrethroids or organophosphates. And those decisions are expensive and have implications for the environment. Yet, a lot of those decisions are not made with hardcore molecular data. Indeed, many of the genes responsible for insecticide resistance aren't even known or cloned from the um, numerous species of mosquitoes that inhabit this state, many of which are known to carry human viruses. So the, the game is the following. We're partnering with uh, many of the mosquito control districts here in California. Our main partner is with the Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District. Eris Haas Stapleton is the primary scientist there, and he's been working with us. And we're coordinating with other mosquito control districts across California. And then the, they have already in place, like Alameda, has really great trapping and uh, GIS data. So they, they know which mosquito, which species was trapped, when and which trap all year round. And you can monitor the distribution of all the different viral uh, uh, mosquito species in all these traps 
as a function of their location. And so that's the density of data just in Alameda. You can extend that pretty much to the whole state when you bring in the other districts. And so our sort of pilot studies at the Biohub have really just been looking at whether, um, what, you know, how to actually do these experiments. Do you use the whole mosquito? Do you use just the abdomen? Do you use just the head? Do you use pools of mosquitoes? Do you do singletons? So we've been doing all these things. Uh, and then, of course, using different methods to subtract host and enrich for what's not there. So uh, what do you see? You see lots of host, of course. And many of this, actually, some of the host stuff is actually important. So we don't want to get rid of it all. A lot of the mitochondrial transcriptomes or genomes have not been uh, published for many of these species. And so that's just a, um, a minor contribution that's important for categorization of the species. Uh, but more important, of course, are the genes that cause resistance to um, insecticides. And so the KDR genes for pyrethroid resistance, some of the, uh, the other channels uh, are, uh, for granophosphate resistance are all present in the data, and we can see alleles representing whether they're sensitive or resistant. And we think that kind of information, assembling that and providing it to in a way that can be reduced to a really simple TACMAN assay or something like that for use in control districts should have or, you know, hopefully will have impact on decision making and insecticide usage in different areas of the state. And we, of course, want to export this to other countries as well. And cataloging these things and figuring out what the distribution of insecticide resistance is one of our primary goals. All right, but what else is in there? That's where the fun stuff is. There's all kinds of stuff in there. You know, we've done a lot of ticks and other insects, honeybees and spiders and all kinds of stuff that I don't have time to talk about today. And a lot of those are somewhat disappointing. I mean, there's stuff in there, but it's not that exciting. But mosquitoes are just chock-a-block full of junk. I can't believe how dirty those little guys are. And um, they contain all kinds of great stuff, uh, also scary stuff. Now, there's lots of nematodes in the mosquitoes we found. They're trypanosomes. You know, we found crithidia in honeybees previously. They're no exception. They have lots of trypanosomes and microsporidia. And I think the microsporidia has been really understudied in mosquitoes. So Nosema serrana in honeybees, of course, is a big deal. What are the microsporidia in, in mosquitoes? And could they be leveraged in such a way to affect some sort of mosquito control program? I think that's an untapped area. Um, now, let's talk about viruses, because that's where the real fun is. There are tons and tons of new viruses. Unlike ticks, where you have to sequence like a couple thousand just to get a, you know, a few dozen viruses, in just one or two mosquitoes, you can have as many viruses as you want to work on. It's sort of ridiculous. Uh, just in this pilot study of Culex tarsalis here in Alameda, uh, in the RNA category, well, let's just take positive strand RNA. There's uh, 12 viruses that we just got out of this small pool of five or six mosquitoes. Seven were completely novel, less than, you know, many of these are less than 50% amino acid adenovine. They include your, all the sort of greatest hits, flaviviruses, picornaviruses, all kinds of interesting things. In the negative strand RNA viruses, lots of orthomyxoviruses, many, some of which are known, but nine of these, nine out of 11, were totally novel and off the charts, required assembly to find them. There are bunya viruses. There are bunya arena virus mix-like things, things that really aren't categorized yet. There are rhabdo-like viruses that we've never seen before. And of course, there's DNA viruses. And the DNA viruses were actually all previously known. But the RNA viruses are rich and replete. And this is one species. Of, of mosquito. I think if we extend to many more mosquitoes, types of species, and different geographic locations, we're going to have quite a rich portrait of the infectious, potentially infectious agents that are in mosquitoes. Many of these are likely to be mosquito specific, but to what extent any of these have the ability to become zoonotic or emerging infections, I think is an interesting point of research. And how we can generate rapid systems to make replicons out of these and study them further will be a point of, of further interest. All right, so uh, the other interesting thing that you can get out of them, if you cut off the abdomens that are full of blood, you can get out what they fed on, too. And so if you separate all the ones that have, you know, engorged abdomens, you get out good stuff. And so we, there was an engorged mosquito. We, sh we just, as a, as, a, as a, like a little test, just cut off its abdomen and sequenced that. And sure enough, and it wasn't really clear what this mosquito was feeding on, uh, it's all birds. So lots of sparrows. His abdomen is full of sparrow DNA. 
And so that's really interesting because many of the mosquitoes in California, the host range isn't even clear. Does it spe feed on birds? Does it feed on dogs, livestock, humans and dogs? And so actually, in just the same metagenomic sequencing that we're doing to get all these other things, you also get the host range of what they've been feeding on. And that can be important for a lot of e ecology and other questions. So I'm just going to like finish right there and say that we develop the workflow. We can capture the pesticide resistance genes. We can capture the pathogens. And we can capture what host they're feeding on. And if we do this in a systematic, orderly way and put it all in one big database, we think it will have impact on how mosquitoes are managed in this country and I'll hopefully export that to other countries where mosquito-borne viruses are a more serious threat. The overall summary here is I think I'm preaching to the choir. NNGS can affect better outcomes in patients. We firmly believe that. And it's unbiased and hypothesis-free, which is important in clinical work in my mind. And surveillance of non-malarial FUOs in other countries are going to help us define that landscape of what else we should be thinking of as malaria control and eradication becomes more and more effective. Uh, and then I just discussed all the insect stuff. So I'm going to finish there. There's a lot of people who did this work. I try to give them shout outs wherever they did it. Uh, and, but uh, the majority of the others are listed here. This was funded by a variety of agencies. Again, right now I'm primarily working with the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub on most of this and my partners at all three universities, Cal, Stanford, and UCSF. So thanks. I'll stop there.